Good morning, saints. Good morning. It is wonderful to see everyone this morning. Certainly thankful that you're here. And we should count ourselves blessed, amen, that we were able to get up and come to worship our God together. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we are certainly thankful for your attendance as well, that you have taken the opportunity to see the need and be joined to us together this morning in worshiping our God and, and praising His most holy name. We're thankful for that. And if you are visiting and you don't have a Bible in your own home, while we try to stay as close to the Bible as we can, there is nothing like having the Word of God at your fingertips to study for yourself and to, to learn uh, His will for your life or everyone's life. So if you're visiting and you don't have a Bible at home, if you'll look on the back of the pew in front of you, you should see one there. If not, please get with one of our members and they'll be happy to help you uh, locate one. Take that with our compliments. Please, we want you to have the Word of God in your home. 1 Peter chapter 3 is where we're going to be this morning. If you'd like to go ahead and open up your Bibles there, you already know that I'm a big fan of, of you seeing it in the translation with which you are most familiar. And then I want you, to, want you to take my word for it. But 1 Peter chapter 3. You know, I was, uh, I was thinking earlier this week uh, of memory from childhood, and I'm sure that many of you in this room, if not all of you, could share this same memory. And it's uh, when I was a youngster, and my mother would go tell me to take a bath, right? And she would say, okay, make sure that you scrub behind your ears and the back of your neck and between your toes. Remember that? And it seems she could go on for two or three minutes telling you everything to clean. And then uh, you go in the bathroom and you can hear the water running from the outside. And after a few minutes, you come out and she says, okay, let me look at you, right? And she's turning your head every which way and yanking your ears to where you think they're going to stretch out like Dumbo's, have flying elephant, and, and then just hands on your shoulders. Oh, you didn't get clean. Yes, I did. No, oh, you might have gotten wet. You might have had the water running, but you didn't get clean. And then she would grab the nearest washcloth could have been the dirtiest washcloth in the house, right? But she would grab it and just scrub your neck, and by the time she was done, you didn't even know if you had skin left. I know that some of you mothers are in this room right now saying, oh, that's right, I want to make sure my baby was clean. Or maybe, maybe it wasn't that. Maybe you were at a restaurant, you got some ketchup or mustard on your face and she'd take a napkin. Nowadays the moms, they'll take the napkin and dip it in the water and then do that. Now back then it was your mother's spit. That was as clean as that glass of water. And so she'd take the napkin and she'd just, just start rubbing and you're just, oh mom, stop. Right? We know what it is to get clean. It, it, even, you know, as, as adults we know what that means after a long day of work, coming in, taking a cold shower, a hot shower if it's in the winter. We know what it is to get the dirt off, to, to be clean, to be refreshed. Even if we're retired, maybe you just got done mowing the yard or a honeydew list or something, right? We know what that, we know what that is. In fact, sometimes it can feel so good, you might stand in there for an extra 20 minutes longer than usual, you know, just to because you're feeling refreshed and it's just, it's rejuvenating to you. Unfortunately, that mentality does not always transfer over to our spiritual life. The idea of being clean. We know what it is to get the dirt off. We know that to be clean is to be refreshed and rejuvenated. Well, when we look at the spiritual side of things, uh, it doesn't always translate for, for whatever reason. So how do we become spiritually clean? The Bible calls it unblemished or, or without spot. Uh, that's what we're going to focus on this morning. 
Just four words found in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. If you want to go ahead and, and read those with me, either in your Bible or on the screen, it says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now you can probably guess the four words of worth that we're going to be talking about this morning. Just, just from that verse, right? Four words of worth. Baptism now saves you. And I call them the four words of worth because they are worth your soul. It doesn't matter. If you're a CEO, it doesn't matter if you're a custodian, it doesn't matter if you're rich or you're poor, none of that matters in God's eyes. Baptism now saves you. Now, I, I realize that, that uh, many people here are already Christians, and so please don't tune me out. Don't say, well, I've already been baptized, so I don't need to pay attention to it. Sure. I want this uh, for you who have been baptized and added to the Lord's church. I want it to be a period of reflection because I, wa I, don't, I don't want you to get out saying, oh yeah, I got clean. Uh, that's what I want you to say. I don't want you to say I came out and God says, no, you just got wet. Right? Now, why do we need to focus on baptism so much? After all, are we saved before baptism? Is that what the Bible teaches? That's what a lot of people say, right? That the only reason that anyone would come forward at the end of a, at the end of a service and, and get baptized, whether it's maybe here or at camp, is just so that everybody else can see that they believe. Well, well let's take a look at a couple of things first. I think the biggest one is the thief on the cross. Now, the thief on the cross, he appears in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And one thief was rebuking Jesus just like those that were passing by. Well, he saved others. Why can't he save himself? Or save yourself if you truly, you know, take yourself off this cross if you truly are the, the Son of God, the chosen one. Are you, aren't you Christ? Now, the other thief, he's in just as much pain and he rebukes the other. And I want us to pause for a moment to think about this, okay? Because sometimes when we read the thief on the cross, we think these people are almost having a conversation like they're sitting around the same table. The typical cross beam of a Roman cross was about seven to seven and a half feet in uh, its width, okay? Now just go with me for math a little bit. You've got the thief in the center, in the center. The thief is the center, but the thief in the center. And so you've got about, let's say, three feet. We'll go on the short end here until the end of that beam, from where his body is to the end of the beam. So there's three feet. Well, we know that these crosses weren't butted up right against each other either. There was some distance, probably about five feet. So from the center of that thief to the end of his cross to the beginning of Christ's cross, you got eight feet. Then you got another seven feet to the other side of Christ's cross. So there's 15 feet. Then you got the five foot distance between Christ and that thief's cross. So there you've got 20 feet and then three feet to the center of that cross. So you're looking about 23 feet, give or take a quarter of an inch. Okay. Now, why should that matter? I'll tell you why, because this thief is over here in pain, hanging on a cross. You have people down there that are ridiculing Christ. He has to lift himself up to cry out over the crowd for the other man uh, to hear him say, Shut up! Do you not know that judgment is coming? You are on the cusp of death. Are you not afraid? Imagine the strength. See, we don't think about that. Imagine the strength. He didn't have a microphone of yelling out over other people so a guy 25 feet away could hear you. Do you not fear God? We are guilty. I mean, it, it, he had to lift himself up several times. He's having to breathe too. His weight is carrying him down as well. 
says oh, we're guilty of what we did. We're receiving a just punishment. He's innocent though. And then he looks at Christ and says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replies with, truly I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. Now this is not a lesson on the Hadean realm or paradise and torment and Abraham's bosom and, and all of that. Uh, in a nutshell though, that, that's it. The, now let's look at a few things about the thief. Some people will say, well, he wasn't baptized. Okay. Well, the scriptures don't answer that one way or another. And so the people who say he wasn't baptized and the people who say he was should probably just be quiet. Don't speak where the Bible has not spoken about things concerning God. But they'll say, well, he wasn't baptized. Well, what, what we do know is that from Mark's writing in chapter 2, in the gospel according to Mark, is that Christ said that he had the authority to forgive sins, with or without baptism. All right? That's the first thing. In the Great Commission of Matthew 28, Christ said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And also, Christ was still alive. The church of the New Testament had not yet been uh, established. The, the church of the New Testament, the church of the Bible, the church of Christ had not yet been established. Baptism was not ne yet necessary. Now, what about the time then between the death of Christ and the establishment of the church on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2? Well, listen to this. This happens after the death and resurrection of Christ when he was among his disciples. This is found in John 20, verses 21 through 23. So Jesus said to them, remember, he's already had the crucifixion, resurrected, he's hanging out with the boys. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. So prior to the death of Christ, you have the blood of bulls and goats, as the Hebrew writer says. You have sacrifice. During the ministry of Christ, you have Christ. And he, says to, and he told them, he said, I have to go away. Where I'm going, you can't follow yet. And when he comes back, he says, okay, now I'm giving you this authority to go off and forgive sins. So we've got prior to Christ's sacrifice, during the ministry of Christ, we have Christ from the, the, him going up to the founding of the church. We have the apostles. Then the church comes and we have baptism. Whether the thief on the cross was baptized or not makes no difference. Not a bit. Christ isn't hanging on the cross next to you to say, surely today you will be with me in paradise. In fact, if, if uh, Christ were to stand right here and say, surely you might be with me in paradise today, or you will be, as much as I want to go to heaven, that would scare the life out of me. Wouldn't it? Whether the thief on the cross was baptized or not makes no difference. The apostles aren't here under their commission to, to forgive you. Whether he's, the thief on the cross was baptized or not, the church of Christ, the only church found in Scripture, had not yet been established at that point. And have you ever noticed that people who bring up the thief on the cross, oh, well, and they say these things that never happened, that they never say they have to die like him. You know? You ever notice that? It's always, well, I can just, I can just ask Christ into my life. We're going to get to that one next. That I can just ask Christ into my life. That's what the thief did. There are so many flaws in that problem, or in that statement. But then there's also, well, why don't you have to hang on a cross like a thief then? Why don't, why don't you have to go steal or something first and then be convicted to the point of execution, by the way. I don't remember the last time they, they gave the electric chair for someone stealing you know, a candy bar or something from 7-Eleven. But absolutely, it's, incra it's crazy. So, uh, you know, no, the thief on the cross isn't going to do. So what about the sinner's prayer? Sinner's prayer. Now, wait a minute. 
Are you telling me that the guy on TV or YouTube or, or TikTok or whatever it is, or those uh, stupid commercials on YouTube that pop up after the cat wearing the hat running through the house, and you, you mean to tell me that he was wrong? When it comes to the sinner's prayer and stuff, absolutely. You, and you know the prayer that I'm talking about. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I need you. I want you in my life, and so on and so forth. Make no mistake, there is absolutely nothing wrong with praying to God in the name of Christ to say, I'm a sinner. That's what the publican did. Have mercy on me, a sinner. There is absolutely nothing wrong with praying, Christ, I need you in my life. God, I need your son. I need the, the light in my life. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But when it comes to the idea that you can say a few words and you are suddenly a Christian, it's ludicrous. There's nothing wrong, though, with pleading for the grace, mercy, and love of God. There's nothing wrong with that. But saying a few words, saying a little prayer, that's not going to make you a Christian. Even David Platt. I realize some of you may not know who he is. He's a Southern Baptist who was elected, I think it was 2014, as the president of the Southern Baptist Convention's International Mission Board, which is a, the largest denominational mission work on the planet. Even David Platt, with whom I have several disagreements with, with whom I would suggest if you do read him, that you have a Bible close by, okay? But listen to what even he said. Should it not concern us that there is no such superstitious prayer in the New Testament? Should it not concern us that the Bible never uses the phrase, accept Jesus into your heart, or invite Christ into your life? If we are not careful, we will take the lifeblood out of Christianity and put Kool-Aid in its place so that it will taste better to the crowds. It's not just dangerous it's just damning. There are a lot of theological problems with David Platt and things that I disagree with. But on that, I wholeheartedly, 100% agree. It should concern us as Christians who know the way but don't like the way. People who think that they can say a few words and that makes everything all right are on their way to the basement. And we as Christians have a responsibility to stop them. Jude would sit there and tell us that we need to yank some from the fire. Uh, we, on some have mercy and on others yank from the fire, hating even the clothes stained with sin. This isn't just the responsibility of the preacher or the youth minister or the elder or deacon. Or any, this is a responsibility of everyone who proclaims to be a Christian. 1 Peter 4.11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, the very utterances, the very words of God. And the word of God does not include, dear Lord, come into my life. Now, the sinner's prayer isn't going to work either. What about all I have to do is live a righteous life? That's a good one, right? You hear that all the time. Oh, I just need to be a good person. You know, God accepts me for who I am, where I am, and what I am. No, He doesn't. If He did, He would not require you to be clean. As a lamb without blemish. Oh, I can just be a good person. That's all God cares about doing the right things. Now, don't get me wrong. We need, to do, we need to be about good works. We do. But we cannot buy our way into heaven, right? The works that we do, the good works that we do, Christ says we do them so that people, when they see them, they glorify God, not us. 
Now think about Cornelius. If you've ever read the book of Acts, maybe it's been a while, but if you've ever read or studied the book of Acts, Acts chapter 10, chapter 11, you come across Cornelius. And this is what we know. From Acts chapter 10 and verse 2, now he was a Gentile, if you were not aware, so not Jew, not one of the Old Testament quote-unquote chosen people. But from Acts chapter 10 and verse 2, he was a devout man, it says. He was a man who feared God. He was a man who gave alms to the Jewish people. He was a man who prayed continually. From Acts 10 and verse 22, it says, He was a man well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews. He was even divinely directed by a holy angel to send for Peter. Now, if we read Acts chapter 10 and 11, this Gentile who wasn't even a Christian, he was probably more devout than most people who call them Chris, themselves Christians today. And that's not a knock on anybody specifically, but it says he feared God. We don't fear God anymore. He was a man who gave alms to the Jewish people. He was a Gentile giving to Jews, and Jews weren't even allowed inside his home. And we know that from when Peter showed up. He said, you know this is not right. It's not legal for me to go in there. He was a man who prayed continually. Not just over a hot meal or when we need it. It's like the parents who, who the, the wife, uh, she has become pregnant with a child. They spend nine months, oh Lord, help my baby to be healthy. I want my baby to be healthy. I don't want there to be any problems. Then nine months, the baby's born, everything's fine. And they say, okay, God, I've got it from here. But you know what? All those things that Cornelius was, a devout man, giving alms to people that weren't his own, well spoken of, prayed continually, divinely directed. We know that God heard his prayer because he sent an angel to him. And yet, in Acts chapter 10 and verse 48, Peter ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Because living a righteous life won't do it either. Baptism now saves you. The thief on the cross isn't going to do it. Saying a couple of words that make you feel good won't do it. Living a good life's not going to do it either. Baptism now saves you. Let's look at a couple of more verses. In John chapter 3... And verses 3 and 4, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Now that's verses uh, 3 and 4. The reference you'll see is for verses 1 through 21, because that's the entire context. So if you go back or you're jotting it down, you might want to read that all. In John 3, we have Nicodemus, who is a teacher of the law. And he has gone to Christ. Now, everybody's familiar with John chapter 3, right? Okay, at least John 3.16. I mean, I know atheists that can quote John 3.16. It's on four million bumper stickers. All right? But we back up from John 3.16. And we get to the beginning of this conversation uh, with, uh, with Nicodemus. And he's asking, uh, about, he's asking Christ, he's asking this teacher, this rabbi, he calls him. And Christ says, look, you, you, have, to be, you have to be born, born again. No, I, I don't get it. It just doesn't make any sense to me. In fact, Christ will ask Nicodemus, wait a second, aren't you a teacher? Aren't you a teacher of the law and you don't understand these things? So when you have people who are big names in the religious world and just under the umbrella of Christendom, and you have people looking at them and saying, oh, well, he's a big name. He should know this stuff. He's got 34 letters after his name that he went to eight schools for and racked up $4 million in debt for. He ought to know better. Yeah, Nicodemus, aren't you a teacher of the law but you don't understand? And look how Jesus responded in verse 5 because he really wanted him 
to get the point. He said, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So unless one is born again, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. And by the way, that water and Spirit is important. Because we come then to Acts chapter 2 when we fast forward. Now, Acts chapter 2, this is the day of Pentecost. It starts off and then they were all together with one accord. They were in the upper room. The sound comes in like a rushing mighty wind. Cloven tongues like a fire lands on each of them. All of the apostles, they start speaking in other languages. Not tongues as in blah, 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 blah. Languages. Just skip down to about verse 6, okay? But in Acts chapter 2, they're all preaching. We just have Peter's recorded, but they're all preaching. And in verse 37 of Acts chapter 2, now when they heard this, now the they is all of these people. There's about 17 different regions that are listed. Pamphylia, Phrygia, uh, strangers, uh, Rome, Mesopotamia, and so on. When those people heard this, Peter's sermon, they were pierced to the heart. It's belief. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent each of you in the name of Jesus Christ and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift uh, of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's important, first of all, because it's like Christ said, First comes water, then comes spirit. Right? When he's talking to Nicodemus. Unless man is born of the water and of the Spirit, and of the Spirit, Christ said. Not or the Spirit, but and the Spirit. Why? Because even Christ knew there's going to be a lot of people who get in the water to get wet. They'll be quote-unquote baptized, but they won't have the Spirit of God in them. They're only out for themselves. They were pierced to the heart. And Peter said, repent and be baptized. They were convicted. They heard the word of God and were convicted. Pierced in the heart. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17. Now I know that we could look at Psalm 19 beginning in verse 1 where the heavens declare the, the glory of God. The firmament shows His handiwork. But you know what? No one is going out and looking at a tree or a mountain or a little brook floating by and saying, oh, that's the God of the Bible. They're saying there's something higher than that. Okay? Higher than us that created that. But, it, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're thinking of the God of the Bible. Why? Because faith comes by hearing the Word of God. These men in Acts chapter 2 heard the Word of God. They obviously believed it. Even though when they started speaking, the people were laughing and said, these men are drunk. And Peter said, you men of Jerusalem, these men are not drunk as ye suppose, seeing that it's but the third hour of the day. It's 9 a.m. They're not alcoholics. And so, he gets to this. They were convicted in the heart. Now, wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible just say that I can, I can just call on God and be saved? Doesn't the Bible say that? Well, absolutely not. Not for a moment. In language, it's what we call a synecdoche. Okay, and what that means basically is that it is a part that represents a whole. You think of a puzzle, okay? You've got one whole picture, even if it's a ten-piece puzzle. You've got a whole picture and each piece is a part of that whole picture. Calling on the name of the Lord is but a part of the whole picture. Let's look at an example from Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on His name. This is when Paul is recounting his conversion with Ananias. After Ananias went into the house on the street called Straight, put his hands over his eyes, Paul had been fasting for three days. The scales fell from his eyes and he says, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Paul saw the Lord on the road to Damascus, 
spoke to the Lord, did what the Lord said. He was a man of prayer, fasting. He was a devout man. He was a student of the law. Get up and get in the water. Calling on his name is but a part of the whole. You must be born of the water and then the Spirit comes. Prior to being born of the water, there is a hearing of the Word of God. There is a conviction by that Word. There is a repentance. There is a confession, a calling on the name of the Lord. And then there is baptism. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Now, why is baptism necessary? And we're going to start to close. I know I'm going a little long-winded today. I'll tell you what, I'll give you that time back this evening, but we just won't have services tonight. But why is baptism necessary? Because according to Paul, I know that nothing good dwells in me. That's what Paul says. There's a lot of people in this world who are like the kid who went into the bathroom after their, after their mother told them to get clean. And they're in there for a little bit, and there's the sound, and maybe they came out with their hair wet. But no, you, no, I'm sorry, baby, you can't clean yourself. Let me do it for you. That's what God's saying. You can't clean yourself. Someone who is wicked, someone, do you, how does someone in sin clean themselves? If we could clean ourselves, we wouldn't need God. I know there's nothing good that dwells in me because the heart is more deceitful and all else and is desperately sick. Oh, Jesus come into this horrible place. Yada, 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 yada. It's not there. And because for while we were still helpless, while we were still sinners at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's why baptism is necessary. Because we're to be buried like Him and in like manner be raised up. When's the last time you went to a funeral and, and uh, you're there at the graveside service and uh, the, the preacher or the funeral director, whomever it is that's conducting it, reaches down, picks up a handful of dirt, tosses it on the casket, and everybody walks away, and that's the burial. Never happened, right? Even when people leave, it, the body is still buried. Baptism is by fully immersing ourselves, not only in the waters of baptism, but to be fully immersed in the Word of God and to be pleasing to God. You see, baptism now saves you. And it's not talking about putting it off until it's a, a convenient time or when a, a special family member can come and witness the event. It says, baptism now saves you. But you know what? Why would I want to be saved? What's so special about it? I mean, what do, what do I get? Uh, if, someone, if, if I'm here today and I haven't been baptized and I come forward and I want to be baptized after services, what, what do I get for it? You, you mean you're not even going to give me a coupon to Golden Corral? Really? Uh, I'll I, I tell you what you get. Hebrews 9 and verse 14 says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The first thing is, is that you get clean, baby. Is that you get washed. Because we can't do it ourselves. The blood of Christ. Just a little farther down we read in Hebrews 9.22 that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. You kidding me? I get a paper cut and I start crying like a four-year-old. Especially if it's one of those between your fingers. You, what, are we going to shed enough blood to save ourselves? No, Christ already did that. Christ shed His blood. For me, for you, for every one of us. And I really want us to think about that. The remainder of this day, the, this week. What does the blood of Christ mean to you? 
And I don't want you to do it with your spouse or significant other. I don't want you to do it with your kids. I want you to get in a room alone with you and God. No TV, no phone, and you really think about what the blood of Christ means to you. And if you're not in that room for more than 30 seconds, you need to get your life straight. But you can, because He died for you. Christians, we have the opportunity to repent. Everybody has the opportunity to repent. And salvation offered by the blood of the cross and shown through our obedience by being baptized, God gives us a clean conscience that we can have confidence to enter that holy place by the blood of Christ. We can't get to the Father without going through the Son. Let's close this morning by looking at Hebrews chapter 13, verses 12 uh, through 14. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. How much time do we spend focusing on the little trinkets of this world? The things that are fleeting, the things that are breaking down. Whereas God says, look, there is a lasting city that you need to be focused on. I know there's a lot of pain, a lot of anguish, a lot of hurt. But don't worry about that. Just focus on me. Focus on the kingdom. And it can be yours. If you are here this morning and you have not been baptized for the remission of your sins, that is the forgiveness, the washing over, the cleansing of your sins, I would encourage you to do that. Don't walk out of these doors leaving your soul in the hands of the world. So it'll just fall through fingers. If you are a member of the body and you have something that is burdening you, maybe there's sin in your life that needs to be confessed, maybe you need to, to speak with someone about it, maybe you're here visiting you in, and you've never been inside uh, the doors of the Lord's body before and you'd like to talk about that. We can do that. I'll stay as long as you need. And you don't want to talk to me, that's fine. Any of our members will be happy to help you. But one thing I want you to know, as desperate as I am for those who are not saved to respond to this invitation, don't think that the invitation is over when we're done singing. God's invitation is always there. If there's a need that you have and we can help you in any way, please come forward while together we stand and sing our praises.